And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, Sorry, the world's greatest you. shit yeah. show, and the and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a returning good brother to the temple, coming to us straight from Son of Oak Game Studio. And the man behind City of Mist, now developing at Tokyo Otherscape, the flagship of the City of Mist Reloaded um, line. The one and only Amit Moshe. And I'm, I apologize if I got it wrong again. No, you got it so good. <laughs> I'm guessing a but, lot of people end up getting it wrong. Sorry, I have to ask, because we did do this before. Am I supposed to be recording this on my side? No, no, no. I'll, okay. I'm all good on my end. Okay. Oh, um, so how, so how have you been in the last few years since the last time I had you on? Well, thanks for having me again. Uh, been very good, thank you. Yeah, hammering away, making, um, you know, making it happen, mm -hmm. and um, really, really enjoying it. You know, and uh, now that kind of city of mist, we've completed the the line. I mean, we're going to create many more books. Hopefully, in city of mist, we already have another one planned for the end of the year called Local Legends, but, you know, now that it's kind of, you know, it's something you can play, it's a pretty vast universe, we're expanding to another aspect of it, and last year we, you know, we asked our fans what they would like to see the most, and it kind of um, aligned with what we were going to develop, which is a cyberpunk setting. Mm -hmm. So, we're on to that, the, the Kickstarter is off to a great start, so yeah. Pretty, pretty happy. Mm -hmm. So, what I'd like to what I'd like to open up with is like the, the last time I had you on, we I had brought you in on, on the tradition of the humble beginnings. Mm -hmm. And in the spirit of that, I'd like to pivot into what history you have regarding cyberpunk, since a lot of people have different points of origin as to how they got as to how they became familiar with that particular genre so what is your origin story when it comes when it comes to it um yeah definitely my my entry point into that is was uh, ghost in the shell the 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 animated movie 1995 i think and um that was later. I watched other things like Akira and many other things, and uh, also read some of the more, you know, key kind of create pieces that define the genre, like Neuromancer, mm -hmm. which was a big influence. But really, the origin of it was for me Ghost in the Shell and that kind of very. It's almost like it's a little um, cyberpunk noir. Like the kind of their moody shots. I don't know. Did you watch it? Did you ever watch it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's like there's like obviously all the action, all the guns, all the tech, all the conspiracy, all the like power hungry organizations, and this you know cyber space uh, entity, and you know really all the components of a of a good cyberpunk story, mm -hmm. and. Um, but at the same time, there are, I really love those moments where Major is kind of just the the main character is, you know, it's just kind of walking through the city streets and in Japanese animation, you know that genre, but also that form of art. It's very good with conveying the mood, and um, you have these moments where it's really like you really can feel the burgeoning metropolis. You know the 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 how dense everything is i think the city there is actually modeled after kowloon in hong kong and um and not even not even after uh, um tokyo as such or or a japanese city but it's just very um you can feel those subjects that are in the heart of cyber so i love that yeah now since we're since we're talking about those kind of origins there's a few a few entries when it comes to cyberpunk that I'd be cur I'd be curious if you were familiar with them in one in one form or another. Um, yeah. One of the big mm -hmm. ones, of course, and in fact, someone say the big one is Blade Runner. Yes. 
up. Yeah, definitely I watched Blade Runner. Um, also, another cyberpunk noir creation, and I'm keep, keep coming back to the noir because noir is kind of our signature with City of Mist. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, yeah, I loved it. It was, I really, there's a kind of a twisted, it's much more noir than than other cyberpunk creations. There's a kind of a twisted past feel to it you know when they when it, you know when he walks around all the mannequins and which are really um mm-hmm. you know synths or whatever they are there yeah there's some really great things about it um and and yet the lack of like any kind of deep cyberspace or even any kind of augmentations or it's really just kind of it shows one question and it focuses on it which is which is really cool um, but it didn't, I can't say it defined the genre for me, if that makes sense. Yeah, I can, I can get, I can get where you're, I can get where you're going with that. Um, for me. It's a choice, me. like, it's a great movie, but yeah. it's, it's a choice. Like, it didn't really touch on a lot of the other, as far you know, as, the as technology far as... that was kind of yeah. evolving and during our, you know, lifetime. Well, the funny thing the funny thing about bringing up Akira and Blade Runner is that they both share what you could consider a common ancestor. That being the work of French artist Mobius. Okay, tell me more. Um now Mobius when it comes to when it comes to um co- when it comes to the French comic scene is a legend. And one of his sem- one of his seminal works was *The Long Tomorrow*. And I don't know if this was the case with Akira, but I do know for a fact that ri- that ri- that um, the director for *Blade Runner* had set- had sent his art team copies of *Metal Herlant* or *Heavy Metal* for us who aren't francophones. Um. That featured art of that featured art of the long tomorrow, and said, "I want the film to look like this." Hmm. And just do just doing a a a cur a cursory a cursory look at it at um at ju- at just some of the art that he did. You can kind of you can kind of see that same level of detail in his work. Yeah. Uh, and it st- and that that made its debut in in heavy metal back in seventy six. So that's how f- that's how far back Mobius's stuff goes. Oh, cool! You mean the the type of art made its debut? That's w- that's when the Long Tomorrow made made its debut in um he- in heavy metal because um heavy metal is not too far removed from. 2000 AD, if you're familiar with that comic, in the sense that it's not a comic based on one particular character, but rather this anthology collection of di- of different characters. Mm-hmm. And with he- with heavy metal, it was not far removed from Weird Tales back back in the back in the 50s, or or even all the way back into the 20s, where you had a bunch of people submitting different stories in these collections. Right. Oh. And you, you what what about it do you feel was the kind of like foundation to what later became cyberpunk? Um I think I'll, I've always I've always viewed cyberpunk as a middle as the result of two things. One was advanced technology becoming street level to the point where in the 70s the fe- the fear of plastics being more and more common was the reason mm-hmm. why you started to see wood finishes on certain appliances and even certain cars from that era. Yeah. And um even Doctor Who had a mo- had a monster kind of tying into that whole fear of plastic. Wow. Um but you have the but the techno but a middle ground between the technophobic and the technophilic. Mhm. And 
because because of that, I I know a lot of people br bring up that Cyberpunk needs to have um, aug augmentations or the like. Um, that's certainly one aspect, but it's more about a specu a speculative look on future tech based on what tech is available now, and that tech being street level. Totally agree on that. Yeah. Um. Of course, there's also the there's also the punk part when it comes to the status of counterculture, since a lot of cyberpunk it is rooted in the '80s, and that's when you started to see the early foundations of the punk movement. Yeah. So, I bring that kind of thing up to to illustrate that you can have aug you can have augmentations. Hell, um, Star Wars in some cases has cybernetics, but I'd hesitate to call Star Wars cyberpunk. <laughs> yeah, no, I wouldn't put it in the... Oh. I don't think that augmentations make cyberpunk. I just do think that uh, specifically communicate communications, network communications, things like that, computer communications, I think that's something that is, in you know, in my generation was evolving very, very, very rapidly. Mm -hmm. And... You know, Blade Runner was maybe of an older generation, and it did, even though already, um, you know. Well, it's also important to remember that. Touched on that. It's also to remember the, to point out that Blade Runner is an adaptation of a story from a from generation earlier. beforehand. Yeah. Um, that being, do androids dream of electric sheep? Mm hmm. Um, although I get the, f I get the feeling you'd probably get a kick out of the, um, out of the game version of Blade Runner that Westwood had made. Oh, I totally played it. How did you know? <laughs> um, just a yeah, hunch. And I'm, ge I'm guessing. I'm guessing that you ended up dipping into the more recent um, re-release that Night Dive handled. No, I actually didn't know about that. I, I, I would get into that for sure. Yeah, Night Dive, who is the who is one of the undisputed kings of re of re-releasing old PC games to work on modern hardware, because. Trying to trying to get old PC games to work on modern hardware sometimes is the wild west. Really? Um, <laughs> mostly, be, mostly because of certain quirks that old PC games can have. But, yeah. Not, but they did a enhanced edition of the of Blade Runner, um, and had to do had that. to do a whole lot of a whole lot of work a whole lot of work under the hood because. The tech that they used for the game was a little bit, a little bit bleeding edge for the time. To right. put it, to put it a bit mildly, and they were, and <laughs> they were really put. Westwood was really pushing things regarding what they ha had planned on doing. Um, but there's a lot of different ways that 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 game can go, which is why I always recommend it to people. Yeah, it's a great game. I really loved is, it. So I remember like so scenes from it so clearly, so vividly. It's just um, it was really good. More than maybe more than I even remember scenes from the movie. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, I do remember other scenes from the movie, but it's, there's some things there that really, really touched me. It was really yeah. cool to play. I think you play another character, right? You don't play the the. No, um, you do. It's just you that play Decker or someone like that. You still you still play Decker. It's just that. They there's no way they were gonna get Harrison Ford to do it. <laughs> okay. So they so they had so they had someone else voice the character because right. well getting getting Harrison Ford to do it to do anything was and it was an ask even back then. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because totally. he's a bit of a grouch is all I'm saying. Yeah. Well, do you know there's uh, I mean there's a uh, there's another Kickstarter coming um, for. For Blade Runner RPG, yeah. so people who are looking into that, they won't get our um, tag based system. They'll get um, that, that's using um, thing. Yeah. yeah, that's using the Year Zero system. Yeah, but, but I think there's yeah. I think there's room for both. I've um I've state I've stated in the past that I never I don't want one game to be the to be the um foundation the foundation by gospel that you have to use. In a certain in a certain design, um, well, let's put it this way: if there is such a game, it's neither of these games. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I, as I mean, somebody, right now the gospel is Dungeons and Dragons. Anything else, 
you know, we're we're happy to share this the indie space with with any indie creator. If that if that's the gospel, I have no I have no problem throwing the priest out of the temple. <laughs> oh, I know. Maybe not the gospel. Maybe the 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 current cult well, leading cult. I um, there's a term that there's a term that I that I use when discussing design called design by gospel, and mm. that is what that is when. You're doing a certain desi design decision, not because it's the best idea for what you plan on doing with that game or project, but because of that being the conventional wisdom, the tradition, what, whatever, whatever um, word you want to use. Um, I yeah. first I first started using it because I'm a big fan of um, Castlevania. But yeah. I was resent, but I always resented the idea that if someone were to do a Castlevania style game, that they had to do it in the style of Symphony of the Night. Um, this was right around the time Lords of Shadow had come out, and a lot of people were lambasting it for not doing that style. And I had found out very early on that Mercury Steam, the developers, had no interest in doing that style. They wanted to do something more akin to. Um, Super Castlevania Four, or the or the two good um, entries in the NES trilogy. That was okay. what they wanted to do. They weren't they weren't interested in doing the open world thing, so they didn't. And it, it was I felt a bit unfair to hold them up to a standard that they had no plans on meeting in the first place. But pe but because people had that expectation of you have to do it in that style. It's a case of, well, you, yeah. if that was the case, you're only doing you're only doing it because not because you want to, but because it's expected, and that's no way to do design. Um, yeah, you know, that's a that's an interesting statement because you know sometimes you need to survive in a commercial world. That's mm -hmm. that's a big you know reason for doing things, and it, you it looks. You know, when you're on the outside and you don't have to survive in a commercial world, you're just a consumer, you can say something like, yeah, why, why are they doing it this way? But when you're an indie developer and you're making that choice because you actually want to sell some copies of the game, I can understand that. Now, having said that, I'm not a person who did that. I could have <laughs> built a company, you know, a 5e company, and I didn't. Mm -hmm. But um, no, I, can, I can understand. Yeah. Now... Getting back, getting back onto the rails. Um, yes. So with with Tokyo other, with we already kind of dipped into the origin of Tokyo Otherscape of it of the fan base wanted wanted to see your take on something a little a little more cyberpunk leaning. Mm -hmm. um, but the other thing that I had, that I had mentioned early on and was mentioned on the Kickstarter is the this concept of City of Mist Reloaded. Yeah. Um, is this is this the first step in your attempt to go a bit more multi-genre with what can be done with um, City of Mist systems? Yes, absolutely. I have two steps. This is the first step, and the second step is still secret, <laughs> and it's much bigger. So, as I've uh, shared with a lot of our fans, I mean, with our fans over a lot of our channels. Um, um, yeah, it's 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 definitely the first step in in turning City of Mist as something more um, usable in other genres because the original is quite adapted. Like many uh, Powered by the Apocalypse game, uh, it's quite adapted to its own genre, and uh, this is going to be something a little more flexible. Mm. Um, yeah, sure. And. Given the fact that you have that you that you're doing that whole modern mythos approach that you did with with City of Mist and now with he now with um, Tokyo Otherscape or or other wor other world, sorry, old ha no Otherscape. You're right. We changed we changed the name because of uh, other world has uh, a trademark on it in the RPG industry, which mm -hmm. we weren't aware of. So we changed it to Tokyo Otherscape. Yeah. But what I, but what I'm curious about is, did has anyone br had um had anyone brought up or or do, or done or done some digging about when it comes to a sh a um, Shadowrun comparison since Shadowrun's kind of had the market share for years 
of that whole that whole yeah. mixture of cyberpunk and fantasy. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, of course. It's been it's been made <laughs> since we launched the campaign. It's been made many times. People have even you know said you guys should. Uh, combine it with your system and there are many interesting uh, recommendations but it's very simple this system can be used for any cyberpunk game or cyberpunk fantasy game um you know it's it's built to be used in any of those things we also say that on the kickstarter very plainly you can use it to play in other in other settings um, you can easily, unlike City of Mist, you can very easily remove the fantasy fantasy elements of this system, because if you're familiar with City of Mist, mm -hmm. everything works on theme books and types of themes that you, your character is built out of four themes, and there are different types. In this game, there's going to be fantasy, cyberpunk, and normal person, <laughs> quote unquote, um, um, themes. And you can just simply not use the fantasy ones, or you can use the cyberpunk ones for any setting that you want. Mm -hmm. So there have been a lot of comparisons to other cyberpunk games, and I think you know people who will be um, interested in this game are people who want to have that immense creativity and and freedom to create any kind of character, and very quickly and without wrestling with a lot of rules, and without being limited by a lot of rules, and without being you know getting dictations of what everything you know how everything is and how everything works and um in that with that tool they can really create any any kind of setting and like in city of mist our setting is going to be a proto setting so it's like a almost like a half-baked setting that you kind of finish baking yourself mm -hmm. it's like uh it's like a shake and bake what's it called it's like one of those things it's like a kit Mm -hmm. And um, on, in session zero, you complete the details in order to create your universe. Um, yeah. So that could be you could you could just as well kind of dump that and say we're playing in Shadowrun, we're playing in Blade Runner, we're playing in whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, now taking that in, taking that into account, you described um, City of Mist Reloaded as. A as a smoothed over or streamlined version of um, what you had done previously with City of Mist. What ex what exactly did you mean by streamlining? So City of Mist, over the years of playing it over and over and over again in many different settings and ways and with many different people, obviously you start noticing what works and what doesn't is a little... I want to say rusty or a little like very specific to the setting and what can be a little bit streamlined and one of the things that <clears throat> that city of mist still has from uh powered by the apocalypse is that its moves are based on um classic trope actions within the genre hmm. and in order to create reloaded um you know you can give up on a lot of overlap between the moves because mechanically the some of the moves do the same thing just in different ways mm -hmm. to fit the genre i'll give you an example there are two attack moves one of them is for you know when you can really clock someone they you have an opening and uh an, or an opportunity or they're vulnerable and you can get in there and really it's called hit with all you've got and the other one is more, you know, contentious, and you, the other person is actively fighting you, and it's called go toe to toe. And you know, for mechanically, eventually, what these moves do um, is give the other character a status that contributes to their eventual demise, one way or another. Of course, in City of Mist, it doesn't have to be an, a, a physical attack; it could be a verbal, magical, social, legal, emotional. You know anything on mental anything under the sun and um but anyway these two moves are overlapping so mm -hmm. and and go to the toe has elements of overcoming an obstacle which is a different type of mechanic so what we're doing with um reloaded is we're separating it there's going to be a move for giving a status there's going to be a move with for um overcoming an obstacle and then a defensive move, uh, an investigative move, and um, 
another move that that is related to boosting or healing and all of these. And that's it. That You're really going to have just five moves. And what we're going to add in order to provide maximum support for players is we're going to add a directory of actions and how you represent them with those moves. So the moves are almost like five magic words that you can describe everything with. And now we're going to give you a list of spells of how to describe gunfights, chases, mm -hmm. hacking, you know, um, negotiation, and all their all their aspects using those five magic words. So yeah, that's 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 where it's going. Yeah, and one of the things that one of the things I saw is that there's there's still that there's still that design of mint of mint of mini books. I guess I I guess I can put it. Yeah. Um, in 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 that in a um Trinity format, and yes. One thing, one thing I'm curious about with the, with that is how is um what gave you the idea of do of doing this tr doing this um trinity of mythos, noise, and self. Yeah, so in City of Mist, there is actually a trinity. It's just you know the the first the core game deals with only two aspects. It, it deals with logos and mythos, which are like mythos and self in um in other escape mm -hmm. and um only the expansion unveils in a way the the aspect of the city that is the mist mm -hmm. and is kind of standing in contrast to mythos on the other side of self so we already kind of had this axis where mythos is on the one side logos is in the middle and mist is on the other side and when we move we took that cosmology over to to other scape where the mist is gone and really there is noise, something similar but different, where people actually can totally see legendary, the legendary and legendary beings and creatures. They just don't care anymore because they are so, uh, you know, blasted with stimuli and with with information in this in this age. Um, so really, what we came up with, we had now mythos, self, and and. Um, and noise mm -hmm. but this axis three-part axis kind of folded onto itself to create a triangle um which also is 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 also kind of the case if you really read city of mist uh, the expansion shadows and showdowns all the way through you kind of see that towards the end as a philosophy Mi mist also becomes connected to mythos and um there is a kind of a loop that could be closed there if that's what the MC decides is the is the you know behind the scenes big revelation. It doesn't have to be this way. So every game is totally different. Um, but when we came to other skip, it was like okay, we're starting with that triangle. So it's already a possibility for noise and mythos to meet one another, and it's kind of like um, what happens if consciousness appears in cyberspace in a machine without any any aspect of self which is a big thing <laughs> in the cyberpunk later yeah. cyberpunk creation and since you brought up Cy since you brought up cyberspace this is a good opportunity for me to address a recurring problem that's happened in cyberpunk rpgs and one that i'm sure you're familiar with that is yeah. what i call the hacker <laughs> problem the it's hacker problem. <laughs> a lot in a lot of games, whenever the hacker is doing his thing, because much like with much like with the party of a fantasy game, everybody's gonna have their one role that they're gonna be at their best with. Um, the hacker is essentially playing a duet game with the GM, and everybody else is just sit is just sitting on their hands. Yep. Yep. Yeah. That's I hate that. I mean, I hate it from a gaming perspective and i was really adamant that we need to solve this problem in in other scape mm -hmm. um yeah so i guess you're you're pitching to the harnessing you know the harnessing solution that we found for it mm -hmm. i mean it's just really it's kind of a meta solution but it works really beautifully because in other scape the hacker can harness the minds of the of their their teammates their crewmates their party if you want to call it that 
And, um, and they do that by creating an interface, a 3D interface, um, you know, a virtual reality experience for them that could be really anything. Now, the interesting thing is that if we really get into it, the person who's defining the interface and creating, so to speak, the villains that they have to defeat within their interface is the hacker, not the not the end target. But um, as they're doing that, they're actually uh, getting the minds of the of the um, of their teammates to process information really fast. So something like penetrating a, um, a firewall could be experienced as a as a as penetrating a wall or getting through a wall or fighting your way through a wall. And if you're chasing, you're trying to trace someone across cyberspace, it could be experienced as a chase. Now, what the, you know, the people who aren't hackers are used to taking these actions, motor actions, ref reflexes, all of these things, uh, but they're, they're doing it in cyberspace and all of that is translated into computational power for the hacker. So what do you think about that? Did you like that conversion? Yeah. Because the key, the key thing is keeping everybody involved. Because some something that I've um, I've been very critical of over the over the years, especially in the last few years, is when there's a certain build that, for lack of a better term, gets more game out of the game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, if you if you need a classic example of this, look at look at and look at certain spellcasters in the bigger fantasy games. Yeah, totally. Compared to more what often, everybody who more isn't a spellcaster gets. Yeah. And by the way, I think that 5e is so successful because it tried to create such options for non-spellcasters. Like, I don't know how deep you go into these things. I don't play it very often. I um, if I'm being if I'm being honest, I saw I saw what they were doing as a case of a nice try. Um. Yeah, but... that's that's fair enough. Yeah, but it's like the idea was that, you know, they were taking a step in that direction. They were saying like, oh, actually, yeah, we see that problem. Let's try to do something about it as opposed to just creating another. Um, and there is that option, like the champion option in the, for the fighter that is just like, boom, boom, boom. I just want to click the same button a thousand times and that's my game. Yeah. And and now and now the fighters have options one, two, three, and four and five as well. <laughs> it's like. I'm yeah. not saying it doesn't feel like a computer game and that you're not t taking the same actions over and over again, which you can't do in CD in this. But, um, yeah, I hear you. It's it's not cool when you have characters that get more game out of it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Now, one thing, that, one thing that I found very interesting that you're, do that you're doing for the, for the campaign is the, is the associated app that you... If I'm not mistaken, you intend on having as kind of a companion to, um, pl to play as well as a companion for GMs. Yes, totally. Oh. what gave you what gave you the idea to do that? You know, you make a, a game about cyberpunk. At some point, you're going to ask yourself, "Are we using technology in the best way that we can for this hobby?" Which I know that we are. And today, it's really not that complicated to get an app of the type that we're trying to create. Um, I know that we have gone as as a as a you know as an industry, we have gone as far as phone PDFs, and phone PDFs can do a lot for you. There could be amazing kind of linking in phone PDFs. You swipe to go to the next page, but it's still just like the the data structure is rigid. You know, it's just you're you're. You can search. You can do a lot of things, but I wanted to take it to the next level. I know that people don't interact with big text and with books in the same way that they used to. And, you know, when I'm on my phone, I don't feel like reading a phone PDF that's a million pages long. I just kind of want to quickly scan the subject and drill down to what I want to drill in, you know? So... Um, and I want to be able to see other media, other media types in that, which phone PDFs w won't give me. I can link from a phone PDF into, you know, a, a YouTube account, but that's a different story. Mm -hmm. So merging all of these, all of these together, I kind of concocted this idea that, you know, I'd be able to swipe left and right to go to the next concept um, and swipe down and up to kind of drill into a concept or going back up to the top. And having a lot of like 
linking there. If we need to change anything, we can just do it. We, as, as a publisher, can do it very quickly. And But the most important thing is that the entire design of the book is going to be based off of a unit called that right now is called a card that will have no more than 100 words. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like writing the game in Twitter mode, but for me as a person whose first book was 500 pages long, it's a big evolution because I realize that people just want to get the gist of it. And sometimes you want to read more, and that's fine. Then you'll have a topic with, you know, I don't know, six cards chained one after the other, and that's fine. But you kind of want to just, like, skim the surface, get the, the get the idea. If you want, you know, have the option of digging in but not having to. Have the option of seeing these things in other ways. Have the options of playing So You know, we have Kevin, the presenter for City of Mist, and... Um, have the, he's, he has the best voice in the world because I first I first heard him as because he created a City of Mist um, uh, podcast, actual play podcast, Rolling in the Mist. And I was like, this guy has the best voice in the world. And, um, you know, we're planning on having some, some, you know, some reading segments that you read. I don't know if you ever played the starter box. A lot of it, the learners you play is based on people around the table reading segments, short, short reading segments. Uh, we're planning on having media for that. So there's really so much you can do once you go over to the app world. Mm -hmm. Now, I will admit there's a few um, there's a few kind there's a few kind of archetypes that I'm curious how in within the, within this take of on Tokyo you um, uh, you utilize them. One of the but one of the big ones that comes to mind for me is. You, is utilizing shikigami since one of the sa one of the um, sample character concepts on the Kickstarter page is the shikigami hacker. Yes. Well, we we always merge mythos and something from you know that contemporary to the time period that we play in. That's our thing. Yeah. And the the shiki the concept of shikigami originally I was like. Yeah, that's like that's like great for like this stealth operative, and they can turn invisible and blah blah blah. But another thing that we do is we try to give things a little bit of a fresher twist. Um, certainly, with City Miss characters, we've really been able to do that, and so so excited about that. And I know that a lot of fans are really excited about our pregens. Mm -hmm. And here too, I was kind of saying, mm, okay, but we've kind of okay, we've we've seen that, we've seen the invisible operative. What what is really a Shikigami? How can we push it further? You know, if you have some kind of being that's invisible, that's used by usually some kind of a yin yang master, summons it and used it, used as a spy or as an errand. It's almost like the aerial servant or whatever you call these things. Um, and and it came to me that that this is a great place to have a meeting point of the. Um, you know the cyber, the noise world, uh, and the technological world, and mythos. Because it would really be badass if this person didn't even have a body that was relevant to the game. So yeah, you know, maybe they're not even a person. So um, I re I distinctly remember when I was doing my deep dive with a game called Heavens and Heresies, which is a fascinating take on um, 5e's rule set. Um, yeah. Because of the way it its wizard is described, we ended up conjuring this idea of, of a um, a magic dealer known as the sommelier who never out never who no one is actually sure what he what he she or they even looks like because every time that that they sh that they show up, they're pos they're possessing somebody. Yeah, or, that's or borrowing or borrowing some pro or borrowing. Um, one one of the one of its um, associates' bodies as a proxy. So it's a case of everybody everybody in the underworld knows knows about this about this person's shop. It's just <laughs> that if you're going if you're going out looking for it, you're never going to find it. Yeah, exactly. But if you're if you're looking, you're gonna get hit. You're gonna get their attention, and th and they will take you to it. I love it. And I love the AI guide, um, you know, trope 
in in if you've read Neuromancer, mm -hmm. it's there. If you read if you watch Ghost in the Shell, it's there. So there is like, um, and in many other in many other cyberpunk things, there's like a guy that's like in the kind of like Ghost in the Machine thing, and um, I love that. So that's where that's where that character came for from. Totally. Yeah. And. The other, something I'm a bit something I'm a bit curious about because of the that um that card that card base setup with this with this Trinity yes. is is cross compatibility. I.e., could some could someone theoretically take a character from City of Mist and transplant a good amount of them into um into Tokyo Otherscape? Absolutely, and vice versa. You could take it. First of all, you could drop a City of Mist character into Tokyo Otherscape as is, uh, and it would still work. You just have to choose if you're playing with City of Mist or City of Mist Reloaded. But mm -hmm. the tags have not uh, changed. The number of tags has not changed. There is a little tweak that we did to the tag system, the way you present them, in the way that if you indent a tag, it's an indication of that that tag is kind of related to or is kind of... Uh, what's the word? It's like nested inside of another tag. So if you have a, it's just a nicer way of organizing. Like if you have a rifle and a sight, and the sight is is kind of indented under the rifle, you know that it's mounted on the rifle. Mm -hmm. So it's just, it's just kind of a more of a technical way of approaching uh, tags. That's and and the other change that we made to the character sheet is that we don't no longer have theme titles as like words that have no meaning instead the theme title is a tag is your first tag and that is you know these are the two major changes they actually don't change anything in terms of the number of tags or how you use tags so you can just take your city of this character and just drop it in in um inside of uh tokyo otherscape or vice versa and it's still gonna work mm -hmm. um you can also use theme books from City of Mist in Tokyo Otherscape and vice versa. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it's completely backward compatible. All right, I I can get I can get that, and I also appreciate the introduction of the um, tracking cards. Yeah, it's actually an improvement. We have tracking cards in in um, in City of Mist. They're not as good as this. This I think is a better design. It's easier to see how it works. Mm -hmm. Now, with that with that in mind, since given the fact that the that um this is a game that lends itself to single shot missions because the player characters are all going to be Ronin. Um, yes. Have have you guys given thought on how, on how one might adapt that setup if they if the GM wants to do a longer form campaign? Oh, it's absolutely not limited to one shots. Uh, this is something that we're adding rather than replacing uh, the um, you know the more in depth iceberg uh, version of City of Mist. Um, yeah, it's that we're definitely going to have all of the longer things. We're going to have the same as we had Avatar op operations in City of Mist. We're going to have Avatar operations in um, Otherscape. Or it doesn't have to be Avatar Operations. It could be just any kind of um, corporate crime, government, some kind of terrorist organization that you kind of work your way through. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's going to be set up for that. You can definitely play a campaign. It's designed to play campaigns. And uh, City Mist in general, with its very deep character evolution system, replacing themes, motivations, being very key to the game and the character... It kind of lends itself more to um, campaign play, but that's why we wanted to introduce that more adventuring, more one-shot, more like, you know, um, rapid uh, elements in Reloaded, so it could also do that. Mm -hmm. And one of the th one of the things when I looked at the that that trinity chart between mythos noise and self that i wanted to ask about is the is the three the three far ends in be in between each of them um avatar singularity and cyborg yes 
So this is just kind of, I don't know, I actually don't remember when it started, but it really took on a life of its own as soon as I kind of saw those connection points. Mm -hmm. And um, when we launched the campaign on, on Tuesday, I um, I kind of, I did an AMA, like an Ask Me Anything session on uh, Reddit. Mm -hmm. And one of the questions was about that, and we kind of started digging into it. And one of the coolest ideas and i think we're going to adopt that at this point this is what i'm going to do is that the, the natural inclination we're seeing when we're creating characters is to use all three theme, theme types like mythos so a little bit of mythos a little bit of um self and a little bit of um uh noise and that's cool i mean you can create that's that's the natural thing you want to try a mix of everything but I think what we're going to do is that if you choose to not have one of the themes, you will get a special ability, a special move um, that is different for each one of the combinations. So if you're only working on th two theme types, for example, if you're working on self and uh, noise, which is technology, but you're not using any uh, magic, which is mythos, you're going to get a special move. And that will also balance it a little bit uh like you said we don't want to have you know certain builds get more game out of it so it's going to give those two types in threat instead of three types characters um more things to do like specific abilities that are unique to them mm -hmm. um, so the fact that you don't have mythos in your mix means that you have some kind of a deeper access into something the fact that you don't have um you know maybe technology in your mix it means something different the fact that you don't have a body or a self in the mix means means that you have a certain ability so that's one thing we're going to do mm -hmm. and the cool thing is that your character always changes in in this in city of mist reloaded just like in city of mist so you could actually change between those things right you could start off with all three and then you can lose your mythos and become like a cyborg then later you can add a mythos instead of your tech and you can become an avatar and so on and so on. Mm -hmm. Now, as I, under as I understand it, oh, the, you're, you're, main you're mainly going with two books. Aside and, of course, there's the box set, but for the, sa but for the sake of that. Um, yeah. Now, what would you be shooting for as far as a... Um, page count for each of those books, um, stretch goals notwithstanding, because I always have to bring that kind of thing up. Yeah, because things true. happen. Yeah. So actually, I'm going to answer it reverse because we usually design, um, you know, we kind of have our vision of what we think we'll be able to reach with uh, with stretch goals, and then we uh, see where we can trim it down a bit in case we don't fund enough and we can't afford to develop everything. But eventually, and like in this case, I think that we're going. We're already unlocked several content um, stretch goals, and I think eventually we'll unlock the things that we want to develop. Um, so the first book we we're trying very hard to cap it at two hundred pages, mm -hmm. and it's interesting because it's two hundred pages for both the MC and the player stuff for the system. And this is a really hard design decision for us, but we're trying to make it more content and less rules you know and less examples city of mist really some some players thought it was too much mm -hmm. uh, some readers i know that a lot of people who love tomes were enamored by city of mist and i know that in general people appreciate the obviously the system and the way it was presented but with the starter box we realize that we can pre present things in a more concise way and we're going to try and do that. And with Tokyo, um, it will vary. It will move between, you know, it'll be between, probably end up between, um, yeah, the same thing, like 150 to 200 pages. Because Tokyo is mostly a content book and that there really isn't a reason to limit yourself there. Mm. So whatever we can fund, we will, we will add because it's just going to give more options. Mm -hmm. um yeah but already the core book has more um theme kits you know we unlocked theme kits so there's going to be double 
theme kits are like ready-made themes that you just have to pick and shoot, you know, and you can start playing instead of thinking about it yourself. So they're a great way to rapidly build a character. Um, and uh, we're going to we're going to have that and we're going to have an adventure included in that, which we're, we're kind of I think it was the first uh, stretch goal or something like that. But because that's kind of the first thing we wanted to do is to make sure that we can fund adding a, a, a learn as you play adventure. Same as the starter box for City of Mist, which was very popular. People really liked uh, just running the game and learning as they as they played. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah so the main things are there i'm sure we'll unlock it it's gonna be we don't want to make it too too big this time. but i don't know i always end up making it bigger <laughs> than than it should what do you think it should be um for me for me the size is not is not as much of an issue as navigation navigation is something i will always be big on it's always something that i talk about and i will keep talking about until someone ties me down and forces me to stop at gunpoint because <laughs> I've had I've had small PDFs, I've had large PDFs, and I've had small and large books that don't have bookmarks for PDFs or an index for physical books. Yeah. And both of those are a deal breaker for me. They're yeah, not they're not enough for they're not having an index isn't enough for me to throw a throw a book out. But it is something I end up bringing up if they don't have it in the physical version or if they don't have um, bookmarks in the PDF version. Yeah. Well, we always have bookmarks. We definitely didn't have an index, which is a big um, disadvantage. I would agree to the book for City of Mids because it is a, a big book. Now it's split into two. But um, it still needs an index, and we have a new indexer that we've approached for that. So that's definitely something we will do. And that's what the app is for. Navigation is what the app is for. So you can really navigate those concepts super quickly, very easily, very intuitively. Yeah, I totally agree with that. Mm -hmm. And for, for me, it's, it's, all, it's, all about, um, it's all about navigation. Cause people ne because you need to be able to point to a certain spot within within a, within any rule set, no matter how complex it is. I know some hmm. think some think that you don't have to do that if the if the rule set isn't that complex, but it's better to have that than don't. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Because no okay. matter how prepared a GM thinks that they are, they're not prepared enough. Yeah, yeah, they need they need they need to quickly be able to access these things. Mm -hmm. I have to run in a little bit. Yep. I really enjoyed talking. Mm -hmm. But um, I will. I will. I will certainly be keeping an eye on on Tokyo Otherscape and how it de and how it develops. And congratulations on getting over one hundred fifty thousand at the time of this recording. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And as al as always. I'd like to sincerely thank you f for taking the time out of your crazy schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness at play here. And anytime I'm you see fit to, re to return, whether it's to delve further into uh, into Otherscape or just or just the plans with City of Mist as a whole, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> Thank you. It's always a pleasure. It's always very thoughtful, and uh, you know, it's I love I love chatting to you. So I'm very happy to come back. Yeah, and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody. <laughs>